Percy and Toby were worried. Thomas's recent accident had caused a great deal of trouble, and the fat controller was waiting for them with important news. Here, he said, is Daisy, the diesel rail car, who has come to help while Thomas is uh, indisposed. Please, sir, asked Percy. Will she go, sir, when Thomas comes back, sir? That depends, said the fat controller. Meanwhile, however long she stays, I hope you will both make her welcome and comfortable. Yes, sir, we'll try, sir, said the engines. Good, run along now and show her the shed. She will want to rest after her journey. sprung, and anything smelly is bad for my swerves. Next, they tried the carriage shed. This is better, said Daisy, but whatever is that rubbish? Rubbish turned out to be Annie, Clarabel, and Henrietta, who were most offended. We won't stay here to be insulted, they fumed. Percy and Toby had to take them away and spend half the night soothing their hurt feelings. The engines woke next morning feeling exhausted. Daisy, on the other hand, felt bright and cheerful. Ooh, ooh. She tooted as she came out of the yard and back to the station. Look at me, she purred to the passengers. I am the latest diesel, highly sprung and right up to date. You won't want Thomas's bumpy old Annie and Clarabel now. The passengers waited for Daisy to start, but she didn't. She saw that a milk van was about to be coupled to her and was most indignant. Do they expect me to pull that? Surely, said her driver, you can pull one van. I won't, said Daisy. Percy can do it. He loves messing about with trucks. She began to shudder violently. Nonsense, said her driver. Come on now, back down. Daisy lurched backwards. She was so cross that she blew a fuse. Told you, she said, and stopped. Everyone argued with her, but it was no use. It's fitter's orders, she said. What is? My fitter's a very nice man. He comes every week and examines me carefully. Daisy, he says, never, never pull. You're highly sprung and pulling is bad for your swerves. So that's how it is, finished Daisy. Stuff and nonsense, said the station master. I can't understand, said the shunter. Whatever made the fat controller send us such a feeble, 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 spluttered Daisy. Let me stop arguing rumbled the passengers. We're late already. So they uncoupled the van, and Daisy purred away, feeling very pleased with herself. She could now enjoy her journey. That's a good story, she chuckled. I'll do just what work I choose, and no more. But she said it to herself.
easy the diesel rail cars work in the countryside was full of surprises. She was frightened of bulls and cows, and she remained very lazy and stubborn. One day, Toby brought Henrietta to the station, where Percy was grumpily shunting. Hello, Percy. I see Daisy's left the milk again. I'll have to make a special journey with it, I suppose. Anyone would think I'd nothing to do, grumbled Percy. Tell you what, replied Toby. I'll take the milk. You fetch my trucks. The drivers and the station master agreed. Percy had never been to the quarry before. He began ordering the trucks about. Hurry along, he said. The trucks rumbled to each other. This is Toby's place. Percy's got no right to poke his funnel up here and push us around. They whispered and passed the word. Hey, Percy, out! Hey, Percy, out! Come along, puff Percy. No nonsense. We'll give him nonsense, giggled the trucks. But they followed so quietly that Percy thought they were under control. Suddenly they saw a notice ahead. All trains stop to pin down brakes. Please, please, please. Brakes gone, please. But before he could check them, the truck surged forward. Oh, oh, they cried. Help, help, whistled Percy. The man on duty at the crossing rushed towards traffic with his red flag. But was too late to switch Percy to the runaway side. Frantically trying to grip the rails, Percy slipped into the yard. Peep, peep, look out! The brake van was in smithereens. Percy's driver and fireman had jumped clear, but Percy was stranded. Next day, the fat controller arrived. Toby and Daisy had helped to clear the wreckage, but Percy remained on his perch of trucks. We must now try, said the fat controller, to run the branch line with Toby and a diesel. You have put us in an awkward predicament. I am sorry, sir, replied Percy. You can stay there till we are ready. Perhaps it will teach you to be careful with trucks. Percy sighed. The trucks groaned beneath his wheels. He quite understood about awkward predicaments. The fat controller spoke severely to Daisy too. My engines work hard. I send lazy engines away. Daisy was ashamed. However, Toby says you worked hard after Percy's accident, so you shall have another chance. Thank you, sir, said Daisy. I will work hard, sir. Toby says he'll help me. Excellent. What Toby doesn't know about branch line problems isn't worth knowing. Our Toby's an experienced engine. Next day, Thomas came back. And Percy was sent to be mended. Clarabel were delighted to see Thomas again, and he took them for a run at once. All are now friends, and Toby has taught Daisy a great deal. She shooed a cow off the line all by herself the other day. That shows you, doesn't it?
Gordon was cross. Why should Henry have a new shape, he grumbled. A shape good enough for me is good enough for him. He goes gallivanting off, leaving us to do his work, and comes back saying how happy he feels. It's disgraceful. And there's another thing. Henry whistles too much. No respectable engine ever whistles loudly at stations. It isn't wrong, but we just don't do it. Poor Henry didn't feel happy anymore. Never mind, whispered Percy. I'm glad you're home again. I like your whistling. Goodbye, Henry, called Gordon. We're glad to have you with us again, but remember what I said. Later, Henry stopped at Edward's station. Hello, Henry, said Edward. You look splendid. I was pleased to hear your happy whistle yesterday. Thank you, Edward, smiled Henry. Shh! Can you hear something? It sounds like Gordon, said Edward, and it ought to be Gordon. But Gordon never whistled like that. It was Gordon. He came rushing down the hill at a tremendous rate. He didn't look at Henry, and he didn't look at Edward. He screamed straight through the station and disappeared. Well, said Edward. It isn't wrong, chuckled Henry, but we just don't do it. And he told Edward what Gordon had said. <laughs> Meanwhile, Gordon screeched along the line. The noise was awful. At the station, everyone covered their ears. Sir Topham Hatt covered his ears, too. Take him away, he bellowed, and stop that noise. Gordon puffed sadly away, but he wouldn't stop whistling until two fitters climbed up and knocked his whistle valve in place. That night, Gordon slunk into the shed. He was glad it was empty. It isn't wrong, murmured Henry to no one in particular, but we just don't do it. No one mentioned whistles. Next morning, Henry was enjoying himself enormously. I feel so well. I feel so well, he sang. Trickety truck, trickety truck, hummed his coaches. Then he saw some boys on a bridge. Beep, beep. Hello, he whistled. Oh, he called. The boys didn't wave and take his number. They thought it fun to drop stones on him instead. They've broken our glass! They've broken our glass! cried the coaches. The passengers weren't hurt, but they were cross. Call the police! No, said the driver. Leave it to Henry and me. What will you do? they asked. Can you keep a secret? Yes, yes. Well then, said the driver, Henry is going to sneeze at those boys. Lots of people were waiting at the station just before the bridge. They wanted to see what would happen. Henry has plenty of ashes, said the driver. Please keep all windows shut till we've passed the bridge. Henry's as excited as we are, aren't you, old fellow? Henry felt more stuffed up than excited. Soon they could see the boys, and they all had stones. Are you ready, Henry? said the driver. Sneeze hard when I tell you. Now, he said. Well done, Henry, laughed his driver. Henry went home, hoping that next time he saw Gordon and the boys, they would have learned not to be so mean.
Sir Topham Hatt works his engines hard, but they are very proud when he calls them really useful. I'm going to the scrapyard today, Edward called to Thomas. What, already? You're not that old, replied Thomas cheekily. Thomas was only teasing. The scrapyard is full of rusty old parts and machinery. They're broken into pieces, loaded into cars, and Edward pulls them to the steelworks where they are melted down and used again. Today, there was a surprise waiting for Edward in the yard. It was a traction engine. Hello, said Edward. You're not broken and rusty. What are you doing here? I'm Trevor. They're going to break me up next week. What a shame, said Edward. My driver says I only need some paint, polish, and oil to be as good as new. But my owner says I'm old-fashioned. Edward snorted. People say I'm old-fashioned, but I don't care. Sir Topham Hatt says I'm a useful engine. What work did you do? My owner would send us from farm to farm. We threshed corn, hauled logs, and did lots of other work. The children loved to see us. Trevor shut his eyes, remembering. Oh, yes, I like children. Edward set off for the station. Broken up, what a shame. Broken up, what a shame. I must help Trevor. I must. He thought of all his friends who liked engines, but strangely, none of them would have room for a traction engine at home. It's a shame, it's a shame, he hissed. Then, beep, beep, why didn't I think of him before? There on the platform was the very person. Hello, Edward, you look upset. What's the matter, Charlie? He asked the driver. There's a traction engine in the scrapyard, Vicar. He'll be broken up next week. Jem Cole says he never drove a better engine. Do save him, sir. He saws wood and gives children rides. We'll see, replied the Vicar. Jem Cole came on Saturday. The Reverend is coming to see you, Trevor. Maybe he'll buy you. Do you think he will? Asked Trevor. He will when I've lit your fire and cleaned you up. The vicar and his two boys arrived that evening. Trevor hadn't felt so happy for months. He chuffered about the yard. Show your paces, Trevor, said the vicar. Later, he came out of the office smiling. I've got him cheap, Jem, cheap. Do you hear that, Trevor? Cried Jem. The Reverend saved you, and you live at the vicarage now. Beep, beep, whistled Trevor. Now Trevor's home is in the vicarage orchard, and he sees Edward every day. His paint is spotless, and his brass shines like gold. Trevor likes his work but his happiest day is the church fair. With a wooden seat bolted to his bunker, he chuffers round the orchard, giving rides to children. Long afterward, you'll see him shut his eyes, remembering. I like children, he whispers happily. Trevor the traction engine enjoyed living in the vicarage orchard. 
Edward came to see him every day, but sometimes Trevor didn't have enough work to do. I do like to keep busy all the time, he sighed one day. And I do like company, especially children's company. <laughs> Cheer up, smiled Edward. The Fat Controller has worked for you at his new harbour. I'm to take you to meet Thomas today. Ah, exclaimed Trevor happily. A harbour, the seaside. Children, that will be lovely. Thomas was on his way to the harbour with a trainload of metal pilings. They were needed to make the harbour wall firm and safe. Hello, Thomas, said Edward. This is Trevor, a friend of mine. He's a traction engine. Thomas eyed the newcomer doubtfully. A what engine? he asked. A traction engine, explained Trevor. I run on roads instead of rails. Can you take me to the harbour, please? The fat controller has a job for me. Yes, of course, replied Thomas, but he was still puzzled. Workmen coupled Trevor's truck to Thomas's train, and soon they were ready to start their journey. I'm glad the fat controller needs me, called Trevor. I don't have enough to do sometimes, you know. Although I can work anywhere, in orchards, on farms, in scrapyards, even at harbours. But you don't run on rails, puffed Thomas. I'm a traction engine. I don't need rails to be useful, replied Trevor. You wait and see. When they reached the harbour, they found everything in confusion. Trucks had been derailed, locking the line, and stone slabs lay everywhere. We must get these pilings past, said Thomas's driver. They are essential. Trevor, we need you to drag them round this mess. Just the sort of job I like, replied Trevor. Now you'll see, Thomas. I'll soon show you what traction engines can do. Trevor was as good as his word. He dragged the pilings clear with chains and towed them into position. Who needs rails? He muttered cheerfully to himself. Later, Thomas brought Annie and Claribel to visit him. Thomas was most impressed. Now I understand how useful a traction engine can be. The coaches were full of children. Trevor gave them rides along the harbour. He liked this best of all. He's very kind, said Annie. He reminds me of Thomas, added Clarabelle. Everyone was sorry when it was time for Trevor to go. Thomas pulled him to the junction. A small tear came into Trevor's eye. Thomas pretended not to see. He whistled gaily to make Trevor happy. I'll come and see you if I can, he promised. The vicar will look after you and there's plenty of work for you now at the orchard. But we may need you again at the harbour someday. That would be wonderful, said Trevor. That evening, Trevor stood remembering his new friend Thomas, the harbour, and most of all, the children. Then he went happily to sleep in the shed at the bottom of the orchard.
the third load of coal you've had today, Gordon, said James. Some might say you're being rather greedy. I'm an important engine, replied Gordon. Important engines need plenty of coal, but I doubt if you would understand that, James. James snorted and went about his work. Later, Gordon was taking on water from a standpipe because the water tower was under repair. I wouldn't drink too much of that water if I were you, Gordon. It might give you a boiler ink. <laughs> said Gordon. What's this? Educating Gordon Day? First James, now you, Duck. Big engines have big needs. Little engines are just annoying. Don't say I didn't warn you, laughed Duck. Later, Gordon steamed into the yard at the big station. That's what I need, exclaimed Gordon. There, emerging out of the sheds, were two shiny tenders. Now, if I had two tenders, said Gordon, I wouldn't need to stop so often, and I wouldn't have to listen to silly little engines. Those tenders belong to a visitor, replied his driver. Diesel sidled up alongside. Everyone knows that tenders are a mark of distinction, but I'm afraid that no amount of tenders will save you in the end. We diesels are taking over, and we don't need tenders to make us important, not even one. Gordon was most upset. He was feeling just the same next day. I'm not happy. I know, said Duck. It's boiler ink. It's not boiler ink, protested Gordon. It's... Of course it is, interrupted Henry. That water's bad. Have a good washout. Then you'll feel a different engine. Your boiler must be full of sludge. Don't be vulgar, huffed Gordon. He backed down onto his train, hissing mournfully. Cheer up, Gordon, said Sir Topham Hatt. I can't, sir. Is it true what Diesel says, sir? What does he say? That Diesels are taking over. Don't worry, Gordon. That will never happen on my railway. One more thing, sir. Why did the visitor have two tenders? Because he lives on a railway with long distances between coaling depots. Gordon felt better. But Henry started complaining. He banged some cars angrily. I always work hard enough for two, he puffed. I deserve another tender. Duck whispered something to Donald. He was going to play a trick on Henry. Henry, he asked, would you like my tender? Yours? What have you got to do with tenders? All right, said Doc. The deal's off. Would you like them, Donald? I wouldn't deprive you of the honor, replied Donald. It is a great honor, continued Doc thoughtfully. But I'm only a tank engine. Perhaps James might... I'm sorry I was rude, said Henry, hastily. How many tenders have you? And when could I have them? Uh... I have six, and you can have them this evening. Six lovely tenders, chortled Henry. What a splendid sight I'll be. Henry was excited all day, all day. Do you, do you think it will be all right? He asked for the umpteenth time. Of course, said Doc. They're all ready now. The other engines waited where they could each get a good view. But Henry wasn't a splendid sight at all. His six tenders were very old, dirty, and filled with boiler sludge. Had a good washout, Henry, called a voice. That's right. You'll feel a different oh, engine now. Henry was not sure, but he thought the voice belonged to Gordon.
One day, Henry wanted to rest, but Percy was talking to some engines. He was telling them about the time he had braved bad weather to help Thomas. It was raining hard. Water swirled under my boiler. I couldn't see where I was going, but I struggled on. Oh, Percy, you are brave! Well, it wasn't anything, really. Water's nothing to an engine with determination. Tell us more, Percy. What are you engines doing here? Hissed Henry. This shed is for Sir Topham Hatt's engines. Go away. Silly things, Henry snorted. They're not silly. Percy had been enjoying himself. They are silly, and so are you. Water's nothing to an engine with determination. Huh. Anyway, said Cheeky Percy, I'm not afraid of water. I like it. He ran off to the harbor singing. Once an engine attached to a train was afraid of a few drops of rain. No one ever lets me forget the time I wouldn't come out of the tunnel in case the rain spoiled my paint, huffed Henry. Thomas was looking at the board on the key. Danger. We mustn't go past it, he said. That's orders. Why? Danger means falling down something, said Thomas. I went past danger once and fell down a mine. I can't see a mine, said Percy. He didn't know that the foundations of the key had sunk. The rails now sloped downward to the sea. Stupid board, said Percy. He made a plan. One day, he whispered to the cars, will you give me a bump when we get to the key? The cars had never been asked to bump an engine before. They giggled and chatted about it. Driver doesn't know my plan, chuckled Percy. On, 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 laughed the cars. Percy thought they were helping. I'll pretend to stop at the station, but the cars will push me past the board. Then I'll make them stop. I can do that whenever I like. Every wise engine knows you cannot trust freight cars. Go on, go on, they yelled and bumped Percy's driver and fireman off the footplate. Ow, said Percy, sliding past the board. Percy was frantic. That's enough! Percy was sunk. You are a very disobedient engine. Percy knew that voice. Please, sir, get me out, sir. I'm truly sorry, sir. No, Percy, we cannot do that till high tide. I hope it will teach you to take care of yourself. Yes, sir. It was dark when they brought floating cranes to rescue Percy. He was too cold and stiff to move by himself. Next day, he was sent to the works on Henry's freight train. Well, 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 chuckled Henry. Did you like the water? No. I am surprised. You need more determination, Percy. Water's nothing to an engine with determination, you know. Perhaps you will like it better next time. Percy is quite determined that there won't be a next time.